Hi, my name is David Ratterman. I'm a member of the construction service group of Stites and Harbison. We're a law firm located in the southeastern United States. We have approximately 24 lawyers in our construction service group. A number of us are also engineers. Uh, we've spent a great deal of time over the course of the last several years investigating something called building information modeling. I'm going to talk with you today about some aspects of building information modeling, its background, its relationship to the business of construction, uh, and how it's evolved over the course of time. Uh, this presentation was originally made uh, to be given to a group of general contractors. Uh, you will have questions after you've seen this tape and we want you to be certain to contact us with your questions. This is an evolving area of the law. It's important for all of us who work in the construction industry uh, to understand it, and it's a way that our industry can be competitive with other industries and with our colleagues in other parts of the world. Uh, I want to start out with this chart that was prepared by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh, many of you have probably seen this chart before. It tracks labor productivity in the domestic construction industry against non-farm labor in the overall domestic economy from 1964 through 2004. Construction labor productivity is the line on the bottom. Its divergence from the labor productivity in the rest of the industry is striking. As you see, not only has the construction industry not kept up with the productivity of the rest of the economy, but it's lost ground in the process. This chart is not illustrating a problem with skilled or unskilled construction labor. To a large degree, it's illustrating a problem with lawyers and the legal system and with designers and owners and bankers and the people who run construction businesses, all of whom have been carried away along on a legal and commercial wave that they can't control. We can develop the tools and the technology to match the productivity of other industries, but we have to do so uh, in a way that we can develop a business environment that will allow us to use those tools to their maximum efficiency. Let me show you an example of a system where the tools do work. This is a slide of market share of steel versus concrete in the UK. That's the Queen of England's UK, not our UK. Over the period of time depicted on this chart, the fabricated structural steel industry in Great Britain embraced design build and integrated project delivery and building information modeling that we're here to talk about today. They changed their way of doing business. Structural concrete did not. During the overlapping periods of time depicted in these two charts, this chart and the previous chart, the labor productivity of this sector of the construction industry in the United States went down, and the labor productivity in the United Kingdom went up. Great Britain and much of the rest of the developed world is way ahead of us in this technology. I'm going to leave advanced copies of a paper with you today that was written by a contractor friend in Wyoming. Uh, I took these two charts from that paper. The paper wasn't written for this presentation. It was given to us to, to review and edit before being published in Engineering News Record. But it illustrates a number of important points that I want to make as part of this presentation. The man who wrote the paper is very successful. He's a steel fabricator. The paper is a scathing indictment of his industry, of the structural steel industry in the United States, and the legal and commercial systems that create silo mentalities. That mentality pit, pits owners and contractors and designers against each other, and it makes construction work inefficient and unnecessarily expensive. The man who wrote this article is not a lawyer, but he discusses BIM and integrated project delivery and new approaches to legal relationships in some length. I am a lawyer and I'm going to do the same thing over the next few minutes. And I want you to think about doing the same thing in your businesses and in your part of the industry. Now, I know some of you might be thinking this is all fine 
but we don't drive the train. The construction owner drives the train, not us. Let me give you some ammunition that perhaps you can use in making these points with the construction owners with whom you deal on a daily basis. As you may have noticed, the first chart, the one that shows the striking gap between construction labor efficiency and the rest of the domestic economy, was compared in 2004. This data was not lost on sophisticated construction owners. At least as early as 2004, an organization known as the Construction Users Roundtable, or CURT, C-U-R-T, took note and released the following statement as part of a comprehensive paper on the subject. The goal of everyone in the industry should be better, faster, more capable project delivery created by fully integrated collaborative teams. Owners must be the ones to drive this change by leading the creation of collaborative cross-functional teams comprised of design, construction, and facility management professionals. I want to give you three quick examples of extraordinary success by sophisticated owners, designers, and contractors using these principles and tools since 2004. The first example relates to General Motors and a construction management firm in Dearborn called Gaffari and Associates. General Motors allowed Gaffari to apply these tools and principles to construct several assembly plants in Michigan. Gaffari developed a more collaborative set of relationships between the design and construction teams that included a BIM program that Gaffari wrote itself and early, early involvement by the general contractor and major subcontractors and suppliers during the design process. The result was that the initial assembly plant built for GM under this system came in 12 weeks ahead of schedule and $10 million under budget. There were six change orders on the project and no claims. Later plants built under this same system by General Motors and Gaffari did even better. I want to touch on one part of the technology now that got my attention when I saw a Gaffari presentation on this technology in about 2006 and it really made a believer out of me. That is that the Gaffari engineers could, throw, could show a three-dimensional digital picture uh, of various parts of this assembly plant uh, on the computer screen. They could turn it, they could twist it, they could look at it from underneath, they could look at it from any perspective they wanted to. They could zero in on individual connections, they could zero in on truss assemblies that had mechanical piping and ductwork running around it, through it, near it. After the structure was built, they went to the same plant and took digital photographs of various parts of the plant, the as-built conditions. They could then lay these visual uh, uh, digital photographs over the top of the computer model and show that the building was in fact actually built exactly the way it was designed. It was just a striking example to me of the use of this technology. The second example that I want to give you today is of Turner Construction Company. On major projects where BIM is used, Turner pre-selects its major subs and suppliers before it finalizes its price. It brings them all together at a facility that sounds like NASA mission control. It's a room with large monitors on the wall and individual workstations with computers. They're all linked together and they use a federated BIM model that we're going to talk about later to go through the project's electronic design, sequence by sequence, all trades, to make sure that it's right and coordinated and that they all have accurate takeoffs and bills of material. Then, and only then, do they give the owner a price and a schedule. Both the Gafari system and the Turner system require considerable buy-in by the owner and by design professionals. The third example I want to give you is of Mortensen Construction Company, which is currently building the arena project in Louisville and, if it goes, the Museum Plaza project in Louisville. Uh, unlike the Turner and Gaffari models, the, the Mortensen model does not require total owner and designer buy-in. Because Mortensen sees such a strong link 
between the use of BIM and its success that it made a company policy decision to convert 100% of its projects to BIM. Within its organization, regardless of whether the construction owner and design professional have embraced BIM or not, Mortensen goes to the cost of converting 100% of their projects over to BIM. These and other examples led Kurt to update its evaluation of this process. This next statement from Kurt is set for release as part of an updated white paper to the industry on this subject. It's coming out in a few weeks. In its, ninth, in its 2009 statement, Kurt says, owners have a unique opportunity to influence the adoption of IPD, that's integrated project delivery, and BIM on their projects. The rapidly accelerating growth of IPD and BIM is driven by an accumulation of incremental successes achieved by individual project teams, which in turn is creating an international groundswell of adoption and refinement. So you're here today because maybe you want to be part of this or maybe you don't want to be part of it, but you recognize that you're going to have to get involved in it if you want to continue to compete in the industry. We're going to give you some background to be able to understand more about what it is you're getting yourself into and we're going to give you some things to look out for to try to give yourself and your companies as much protection as you can in the law as this area develops behind the technology. I'm going to go through several points here, several slides of examples uh, to give a general background of BIM that I think is important to understanding it and important to uh, recognizing the legal significance of some of the contracts that, that are going to involve BIM. The first organization I want to talk about is one that I'm close to, the American Institute of Steel Construction. Structural steel design and fabrication and field erection lend themselves to this technology. So the steel industry was able to jump out in front of this area uh, in the early to mid 1990s. At that time, AISC recognized that tools were becoming available but were not being applied to use in the construction industry to anything near their full potential. There was not interoperability, and that's a term we're going to talk about later. There was not interoperability between the various computer programs that were being used by designers and fabricators and other people in the industry. So AISC undertook a worldwide search, and that search uh, ended up at Leeds University in Great Britain. Leeds had developed a tool called CIS2, it's also called SimSteel. It's a neutral file that was funded by the European Union. Uh, I like to refer to it as an inverted Tower of Babel, that you can have various computers that all speak a different language and they read into this computer neutral file and they can understand what each other is saying. Uh, the European Union paid for development of SimSteel, but it didn't have money to update it to keep it current and to develop it. So AISC stepped in, they furnished the funds, and they made it available to the construction industry in the United States. And it's been a terrific success story for fabricated structural steel. The rest of the world is still way ahead of us in, in this technology. Uh, the overarching international organization attempting to coordinate application of the evolving techni technology in this area is an organization called the International Alliance for Interoperability, or IAI. Among other things, IAI develops inter international industry foundation classes, something called IFCs that you may hear about, for BIM to help keep technicians and software developers all on the same page and speaking the same technical language. The National Institute of Building Sciences, NIBS, N-I-B-S, is the North American branch of the IAI. NIBS writes something called the National Building Information Standard, or NBIMS. This is focused not only on building design and construction, but also on building operation. A subsidiary organization sponsored by NIBS is something called Building Smart, and now it's getting down close to what all of us do every day. Building Smart writes something called the United States National CAD Standards, 
and is focused more closely on the work of the people in this room. Building Smart is working with software developers and industry groups like AGC and AIA and AISC to work through some of the technical and legal issues that we're going to discuss. Building Smart is going to become more and more important and more and more relevant to your work as time goes by and I encourage you to get involved in its committees and in its work across the country. Two other organizations that you should be aware of are the National AGC BIM Forum and the ACCL AISC e-commerce BIM Roundtable. The AGC BIM Forum is an organization of working contractors, owners, and designers who meet quarterly to address the business and commercial aspects of application of BIM and IPD. This group developed the Consensus Doc BIM Contract Addendum, which will be discussed later. John Tossi, a general contractor from Boston, received one of ENR's Person of the Year awards in 2008 as a result of his work as chairman of the AGC BIM Forum, and I'm going to talk more about John later. The ACCL AISC e-commerce BIM Roundtable meets once a year to discuss the legal and technical aspects of BIM and IPD in conjunction with the North American Steel Construction Conference. This year that meeting will be in Phoenix on March 31st and it will fo its focus will be on interoperability issues which we will be discussing in a moment. Okay, so with this background, what is BIM? NBIM designs BIM as follows, a working definition in their words. Digital technology to establish a computable representation of all the physical and functional characteristics of a facility and its related project life cycle information. It is intended to be a repository of information for the facility owner operator to use and man maintain throughout the life cycle of the facility. Now, this is pretty dry, but it's important to note that this doesn't say anything about construction and also note that it's not limited to clash detection or 3D depiction. Construction and contractor groups commonly think of BIM as only dealing with clash detection. It's important that we understand that the real potential strength of BIM is the fact that it can be applied to a whole list of uses beyond just clash detection. Let me read through this list. Application of BIM can include conceptualization, which is optimizing the function and habitation and sustainability of a building. Designers can use BIM during the design process to turn the building inside out and upside down and round and round a thousand different ways and try out a million different components and ideas. This is where designers and owners can really get into meaningful analysis of cost and function and sustainability. BIM can be, to, be used to develop the design of the building. It could be used in conjunction with all the ma major players, as we've discussed earlier with the Turner model. It can be used for permitting. The Clark County Building Office in Las Vegas is experimenting with the use of BIM for their plan checking uh, function. It's not available everywhere yet, but it's coming. BIM can be used for coordinating construction documents. BIM can be used for construction and scheduling, for building startup and testing, and for building maintenance and operation. When you attend some of these national conferences, this is primarily what the owner's representatives want to talk about. They want us to, to be sure that whatever model you use in construction, they can also use in the long-term maintenance and operation of their buildings. This seems to be especially true of the Corps of Engineers. They seem to be obsessed with the potential long-term use of BIM for building maintenance and operations. One important feature and component of a building information model is something called a data-rich element. Uh, BIM, as I've said, is not limited to a 3D depiction. Uh, I'm going to use the example of a structural steel beam. Depending upon the software and base model used by the architect, by clicking on a steel beam in the model, you can determine the material test report data for the beam, what mill it was made, 
what heat it came out of, when it came out of the cauldron, what the metallurgy of the beam is, and what the piece number is. This is one dimensional information. This is information that you would get on a printed piece of paper. One dimensional. Uh, by clicking on that beam you can also read the physical dimensions of the piece. Its length and its width and its depth. This is 2D information. You can also obtain the exact orientation of the beam in the building in relation to all the other beams and columns in the building. This is 3D depiction. This is the third dimension. In addition to that, you can click on the beam and determine the schedule for delivery, when the beam is going to be ready to be delivered to the project site. This is called 4D, or fourth dimension of information from the beam. And finally, you can receive cost and pricing data on the beam, the fifth dimension. There's one final set of definitions I want to talk about before we start talking about legal liability and contracts. Definitions that lead into the evaluation of a contract that you're going to have to undertake. The first is something called a parametric model. A parametric model is a model utilizing a process by which an object modified in one view will be automatically updated in all other views and schedules. A federated model is like the United States. It's made up of component parts. It's a model consisting of linked but distinct component models, drawings derived from the models, texts, and other data sources that do not lose their identity or integrity by being linked. So that a change to one component model in a federated model does not create a change in another component model in that same federated model. Now this is a, an important distinction between federated model, a federated model, and a parametric model. Uh, it's common for lay people to think of BIM or to think of a, the three-dimensional modeling process as automatically changing every component, every affected component uh, in the design when any individual element uh, is changed. Uh, this may be possible in the future, this may be possible in some elementary models now, but it's not possible in a complex construction system. So uh, on large projects, on complex projects, the BIM model that's used for overall design and construction and building maintenance and operation is in fact a composite federated model made of interlinked individual models. And we're going to talk about this in the context of construction contracts in a moment. The next uh, concept I want to discuss is that of interoperability. And you're going to hear uh, us talk more about interoperability later. Inter interoperability is defined as the ability of various software used in a federated model to share data. The ability of one software package to read or use certain types of data generated by a second software package without either ignoring or changing that data. In other words, when you have a federated model, the various component or individual models that make up the federated model have to be able to talk to each other. They have to interoperate with each other without disrupting the data, without uh, corrupting any of the information that's going back and forth. This leads into the next topic, which is corruption of data. As the name implies, this is the end result of a lack of sufficient interoperability. If the programs don't interoperate, the data will be corrupted. The data should be transferred and utilized without being changed. Data in a working federated BIM model should be capable of something called round tripping. Design data should be capable of being sent from one model into another model and then returning back again to the join model without being repurposed or corrupted. This is an issue in the industry today. Achieving full interoperability in a federated model is one of the greatest challenges currently facing the industry before we can have full integration of the technology. Some software programs and some companies do a much better job of this than others. Right now most of you are saying to yourselves, how did I get myself into this mess? I don't have any idea what this guy is talking about. I'm a contractor. 
What do I know about things like interoperability and round tripping and data corruption? Well, help is on the way. Uh, these problems are beyond most all of us who are not in the software design business, but as you'll learn later this morning, the industry is developing ways to deal with these issues, to work around them, uh, and to prevent potential legal liability created by these issues. With that background, let's talk about legal principles. The first thing I want to talk about is application of BIM to traditional projects. And when I say traditional projects, I'm talking about traditional design, bid, build projects or traditional cost plus projects. On a traditional construction project, the legal relationships between the parties and the legal principles involved shouldn't change. Traditional form contracts that you use in your business every day with modifications should apply. However, there are two areas where I have particular concern and that you should be aware of. The first is you need to be aware of the limitations of use and the liability for components of federated models. If you are developing, if you or your company is developing a model that's going to be used on a project, you have to have very clear terms in your contract uh, asserting what it's going to be used for, what it's not going to be used for, and what the restrictions on it are. You also have to be certain when you receive a model from someone else involved in the same project that you need to know what the limitations of the use of that model are, how it's to be applied, and what, uh, what possible liability applies from its use. Finally, on a, on a traditional construction project, you need to be aware of the definition of contract documents. And this is particu a particular concern to me. It is possible on a traditional construction project for the written two-dimensional drawings to be the legal contract documents for use on the project. However, on that same project, it's also possible that the work will all be done off of a three-dimensional computer model. This to me is a problem because while you may be operating off of a computer model, if something goes wrong, the law may hold you to the standard of the 2D drawings. So you have to be aware when you're going into a project what the contract documents are. On non-traditional projects, such as integrated project delivery or collaboration or alliance contracting, the legal landscape is less clear. It's still under construction. It's still developing as the technology develops. There are several areas for specific inquiry and concern when you're using BIM in a new type of contract and a new legal relationship, and we're going to cover those now. The first is Appendix A to the AISC Code of Standard Practice. This is used primarily for fabricated structural steel, and it's used when there are no written 2D documents. This appendix is to be used when the job is designed and built completely off of a, an electronic database and a BIM model, and 2D uh, traditional paper drawings are not used. The second is a uh, as a form contract established in 2008 by the Corps of Engineers. This contract is very specific as to the uh, hardware and software that must be utilized on a Corps of Engineers project and to that degree it's somewhat controversial. The third is the uh, Consensus Docs BIM addendum that was developed by the con Consensus Docs process. Uh, this was developed largely through the efforts of National AGC. The next is an American Institute of Architects document, which is no surprise, is in competition with the Consensus Docs AGC document. All of these documents are good starts, uh, but care is required. None can be utilized off the shelf like a traditional AIA or AGC a contract form on a traditional 2D pr uh, project. Uh, we want you to be aware that these contract forms exist, uh, but we want you also to be aware that none of them can be used without con uh, considerable input and without customizing these forms for individual projects. Now we're going to give you a checkoff list of items you need to be looking for and thinking about 
when you're about to sign a contract that will involve the use of BIM. Some of these points are obvious and some build one on the other. Some are not, some we've already discussed to some degree. The first is who will be the model master? Who's directing traffic between the various component models of a federated model system? Who's in charge of keeping the model up to date and overseeing changes? The design professional is not necessarily the best person to be the model master. Maybe the model master should be the construction manager. Maybe the model master should be a general contractor, or maybe it should be the owner. But a good model master can go a long way toward avoiding problems with the lack of interoperability and data corruption that we talked about earlier. I can almost guarantee you that John Tossi, the chairman of the AGC BIM committee that I mentioned earlier, the man who won the Engineering News Record Person of the Year Award, uh, is going to make sure that his company is the model master on all of his projects if, if there's any way that he can make that happen. You need to be aware of what the hardware and software requirements are for this particular project because they can vary from project to project and from owner to owner. You need to be aware what the team membership will be and how the team will be formed and brought together and what the expectations of all the participants in the team will be because this will vary from project to project. You need to know how and when the design and the schedule and the budget and the contract price will be finalized because it may not be at all traditional. It may not be the way you're used to doing business. You need to be aware of what individual models will be created and how they'll be used. What's going to be expected of any model you have to to uh, prepare. Uh, what can you expect from the models that you're going to be using? All of these should be spelled out in the contract terms. You need to know how changes to the model will be tracked, who's going to make them, how they're going to be memorialized. It's not the same as a changes to 2D paper drawings. You need to know what the ownership and license rights are in the models. You need to know how the risk of error will be allocated, who's responsible for an error in the program, who's responsible for a software error. Under one of the form contracts, the risk of error in the, in the uh, a computer program itself in the software is allocated to the owner because it's felt that the owner will get the benefit from the use of the software. An error in the software is something that the contractors or the designers just can't control. In that instance, if I recall properly, there's a time extension but no money in the event of an error in software. And finally, you need to know what incentives and what penalties apply. I've gone through this very quickly, and I apologize for reading part of this presentation and giving you definitions that are, are somewhat difficult to follow. I appreciate your patience in watching this tape. Uh, we are going to be open to any questions that you might have about this subject matter, and I, I thank you for your attention.